Like so many of you, James Zogby was born of parents of Lebanese descent. His mother, Celia, was from a Pennsylvania coal town. His father, Joseph, immigrated at the age of 25. Cecilia was a teacher. Joseph was a grocer in a very diverse Utica, New York. His parents saw beauty and strength in Utica's diversity. Powerful lessons were doled out at the Zogby table. How to debate respectfully. How to listen. What is right and how to fight for it. Also, when you feel defeated, deflated, or have a moment of self-doubt, how to look beyond yourself and continue to fight. When Jin was down and in the dumps, his mother would say, would it be noticed by someone riding by on a horse? And of course, what she meant was that history is a continuum. Many, many events and many opportunities to fight for what is right and create something good, even in the midst of trying times. And it's obvious, standing here tonight, that Jim not only absorbed these lessons, but he has lived them. Whether it was standing with the African American community during the Civil Rights Movement, opposing, go ahead, please. <laughs> opposing the Vietnam War, or fighting for Palestinian rights, In all of this, he saw the righteousness of supporting the broader struggle for justice and humanity. And he's right, because how can you ask another to stand allied with you in your cause if you do not stand allied with them? That is a lesson of unity through diversity that also comes from Lebanon. That love of Lebanon that I've learned from knowing so many Lebanese Americans is rooted more than just in your heart or in your soul, it's rooted in your bone. And it is what is inspiring the people demonstrating in the streets right now. And thank goodness, thank goodness because it's helped make this country great as well. I know I don't have to tell this room about how much Americans of Lebanese descent have contributed to America. But I am glad to share the story of this one particular Lebanese American who literally, literally breathed life into the idea of Arab American political identity. In the late 1970s, Jim believed that more should be done to support the Palestinian struggle for justice, so he founded Palestine Human Rights Campaign. Not long after that, the organized effort to disparage and exclude Americans of Arab descent from, politi from politics led, led Jim to co-found the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. In the early 80s, he co-founded Save Lebanon, a private nonprofit humanitarian, non secretarian relief organization giving care to the victims of war, that war that went on for year after year after year. And I was there in 80 and 82 and, of course, saw the great work that he provided in the years that followed for the victims of that war. Of course, in 85, he founded the Arab American Institute, where he continues to serve as president today. And in the 1990s, during more hopeful times, it was Builders for Peace, a private sector committee promoting investments in the West Bank and Gaza. To go into the accomplishments and achievements of these organizations would put me way over my allotted time. So let me instead just share a few quick insights from knowing and fighting alongside Jim for decades. You know, he's never been one to shy away from hard truths hold back from the powerful, or take the easy road. And I've seen him for many, many decades take on the powerful. I'm sure some of you have seen it as well, whether it was monarchs or presidents or prime ministers, revolutionary leaders, members of parliament, 
cabinet secretaries, members of Congress, you'll know where Jim Zogby stands, and it will be on the side of justice and for those who need a voice, someone to speak when they cannot. And how do I know this? Because this may shock you, Jim and I have been and continue to be lifelong Democrats. The party didn't welcome him with open arms. He had to fight for his place and that of this community. So I've seen him take on powerful political interests to stand for a more just policy in the Middle East, one that respects the integrity of Lebanon and recognizes the righteousness of the Palestinian cause. He's advocated against wars, the death penalty, and I'm, if I might say, I happen to know one little thing that he does that most people have no idea, and that is the, that National Democratic Committee's budget, and he has been arguing for its transparency for many, many years. He's still fighting for that one. I don't know what Jim considers to be his most important accomplishment. He probably hasn't stopped to think much about it. But I can tell you, hailing from Michigan, I know one of the most important things he's helped build is an educated, driven, and active Arab American political community. One that seeks to be of service and stands with its allies to help this nation realize its great promise. And we share one other thing, and that is the fact that one of the people he relies on the most, the Institute, is Maya Berry, who actually worked for me for several years up on the Hill. <laughs> Knowing good people and how to get good people and keep good people isn't easy as many in the room can tell, can tell you, and Jim is very good at it. I've shared the broad strokes of why I believe Jim is deserving of this Rene Mouad Outstanding Community Service Award. Now I invite you to watch this very brief video to see for yourself. James Zogby was born to Joseph and Celia Zogby in Utica, New York in 1945. A supporter of the civil rights movement, Jim found himself working alongside Reverend Jesse Jackson. He thrived under his mentorship and gained a deep understanding of the struggle for inclusion, equality, and justice, and how it connects communities across all divides. It's a lesson and a message he shared at the historic 30th anniversary of the March on Washington. Let us who are part of this great march commit ourselves to an America of tolerance, to an America of diversity, to an America of freedom for all. Let us reach out and never stop reaching out to those who would become a part of us. Reaching out wasn't just a slogan. Following Israel's 1982 invasion of Lebanon, Jim knew Lebanon needed Americans to reach out. Save Lebanon would do just that, educating Americans about the conflict and bringing dozens of injured Lebanese to the United States for medical treatment. Beyond Lebanon, Jim also helped break the silence around the Palestinian cause in America, bringing the first ever mention of Palestine to the floor of a presidential nominating convention. I'm proud to put forward the Jackson minority plank on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Human rights, equal rights, and peace. His belief in reaching out did not exclude those in power, who often need to hear difficult truths, and who respected Jim's incisive analytical mind and commitment to saying it like it is. He also helped bring the Arab American community's voice to the national media. For Palestinians, that there's been a century of broken promises. Jim's work in service to community not only helped create an Arab American identity, it also opened doors for our community to proudly serve their country as Arab Americans. For Jim, the mission has always been rooted in family. His parents gave him the character and moral courage that would come to define his work, and his family, his wife Eileen, children Liz, Joe, Sarah, Matt, and Mary Margaret, served as the inspiration pushing him forward. Now with many grandchildren to call him Jiddo, Jim is moved to reach out again, speaking out on climate change, immigrant rights, and income inequality. We are all better off with him in this fight. Tonight, uh, Jim, just for a moment, we're putting aside your mother Celia's wise words. We have stopped riding our horses and we are pausing at this moment in history to look at you. And while we acknowledge your accomplishments, we thank you for them too. So on behalf of the foundation, I am pleased to present the 2019 Outstanding Community Service Award to Dr. James Zogby.
for me to take it to the table? Yeah. Please. I got you beat by one year. My wife and I, that picture was our 50th last year. <laughs> she broke her shoulder and cannot be with us tonight. She, uh, she's at home. Uh, and, I, um, and I wish she were here. Because uh, she would have seen me in a way she doesn't know me. Um, but I do the, the dishes and I make the beds. Um, <laughs> She says she's trained me very well. Um, Dave Bonnier, thank you so much. Um, I am honored to be honored by you because I've known Dave Bonnier um, as a legend. I mean, talk about fighting for principle. I mean, this guy was the number two uh, in leadership in the Democratic Party for years and was pro-Arab, pro-Palestinian, and pro-life. That's a big deal. People respected him. They didn't agree with him, but they respected him for his leadership and his commitment, and he got the job done. Um, and when he took Maya Berry from me, I was furious, but he trained her well, and she came back, and she's running the Institute, and I'm thrilled uh, to have her again. And that's our staff in the back of the room, and I, I really appreciate everything that they do. Listen, I just have a few observations tonight. I was thinking about a poem that uh, Khalil Gibran wrote. It's actually one of the things he wrote that I like the best. Uh, you have your Lebanon, I have my Lebanon. And what we learn from that is that there are, uh, in every society, two societies. There are two visions. There are, in some cases, multiple visions. And we're seeing one vision of Lebanon play out in the streets. And they're protesting, and they're not just for democracy, they're not just for opportunity, they're not just for better government, they're against corruption. They're against dynasties that have become so ossified that they no longer are capable of seeing beyond their own self-interest and providing for the country. And they're against, and this may be controversial to some, they're against an armed militia that wants to impose by force its will on a people. And yet, as we look at one Lebanon and the other Lebanon, understand both coexist. And we have to be aware of both at the same time. And I want to enlarge upon that by just bringing it home because I also believe that there are two Americas. They play out all the time. Look, you saw that you me at the convention. The very first time I spoke at the convention was 1984. I got to nominate Jesse Jackson for president. I walked out and I looked at the convention. I have never spoken at a convention. It's a huge, intimidating experience. And I walked out there and I started. I said, I'm the son of an illegal immigrant and I'm gonna nominate for president the great-grandson of a slave. Where else but America could that happen? My dad came in the 20s when, in the words of Senator David Reed from Pennsylvania, we don't want any more Syrian trash in America, and so they canceled it, they zeroed out all the visas. Uh, it was impossible. If you had family here and you were there, you couldn't come and join them. That was that era's definition of family separation. So, so many of our people went to Brazil or went to Argentina or went to the Americas because they couldn't get into America because we zeroed out those visas. Syrian trash, that's what we were back then. Um, and he came, he was in hiding uh, together with uh, others. Uh, so many of the Lebanese who came back then were, were undocumented and got amnesty in the 30s and became a citizen in the 40s. And I have my wall, it's my America wall in my office. It has my father's naturalization paper and it has when President Obama appointed me my presidential parchment. And again, I look at that every day and I say, that's America, where you can start here and end up there. And opportunities are available to you because it's a different country, but there's, there's, there is that other part of America. It's not all the Statue of Liberty. It's not all the welcoming America. It's also the America that has turned its back on, on immigrants and turned its back on refugees and turned its back on people who have needs. Look, I have a daughter, a granddaughter with Down syndrome. She became a poster child during the 
uh, the debate over Obamacare because um, my daughter fought, my daughter fought so that a child with pre-existing conditions would always, always be available to get health care, would never be denied the opportunity that everybody else so needs. And my son, Joe, who works for Senator Durbin, was one of the authors of the DREAM Act because he knows my father's story and he knows his grandfather's, his Jiddu story, that he was undocumented and that so much, so much has been done by those who came, became American, and made America a better place. And so we never want to close the door, but we always understand that both are here. Both visions are here all the time. And I say to people, never think that we're just the America of the lady in the harbor. Because if you do, you become vulnerable to those who don't share that vision and who can actually come and defeat you. But also never forget that those folks, that other vision is there. It's there all the time. But also never forget the lady in the harbor because I believe in the end she always wins. That vision always wins. We've had periods in our history before, David Reed, David Reed, you wouldn't even know David Reed existed if I didn't mention him to you. But those bigots from the 1920s, they're gone. Their vision died with them. The Reverend Coughlins are gone. Their visions died with them. The Bull Connors are gone. Their hate died with them. But we have alive today a generation of Americans fighting for a better America, fighting for a vision of equality, fighting for opportunity for everybody. Um, and it's the same in Lebanon. The dynasties aren't going to go. The corruption isn't going to go. And the militias aren't going to go. But what is going to happen is that the people in the streets are going to define the future of that country. And we're so proud of it because you have your Lebanon, I have my Lebanon. I'm seeing mine play out in the streets every single day. I was asked just, as somebody said what my legacy, Dave, David spoke about what my legacy is. You know, I do, I feel an enormous sense of pride at the 400 or so interns who've gone through my office and have done incredible things. When I came to Washington back in the 1970s, there were so few people of Arab descent actually in public service doing things. And now they're heading immigrant groups, they're heading uh, groups, legal civil rights groups, they're heading human rights groups. Amnesty International wouldn't take on cases because it was too controversial to get into Arab stuff back then. Their office is filled right now with Arab Americans doing this work and doing it well. And they're in the Hill and they're in State Department and they're in agencies across the government. And it is, makes me so proud to see that. But even more proud, um, the, what I have feeling about what my kids are doing, what my family's doing, they would make my mother really proud. Celia brought us up um, as fighters. And my daughter's a fighter, my son's a fighter, actually all my kids are fighters, and I got a granddaughter who's 16 who was gonna be here tonight and she's staying home with her grandmother. Um, but she is going to college next year and she is doing things right now that I couldn't even imagine doing when I was 16. I am just so proud. My legacy at the end of the day is really my kids and my grandkids because they're the ones who are carrying on everything that represents the hope and the promise of what America has meant and continues to mean, because I have my America and you might have your America. But I think in the end of the day, my Lebanon and, your, and my America are going to beat everybody's, and we're going to win. Thank you very much.